Welcome back, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here with another CHP episode for your ever-expanding collection, number 227, The Seven Great Singing Stars of Shanghai, Part 2. Well, we didn't get to them in Part 1, but this time I assure you, you will get to meet them all, or at least four of the seven. I suppose I should have titled last episode an overview of the life of Li Jinhui, but well, my marketing people here said go with The Seven Singing Stars, Part 1. It'll attract more listeners, so who am I to argue with them? Everyone who felt cheated and misled with last episode's title, I'll try and make it up to you this time. I didn't mention this last time in part one, but most all of these jazz musicians who performed in Shanghai in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, they were mostly Filipino and Russian. Yeah, they'd ship guys like Whitey Smith, Teddy Weatherford, Buck Clayton, and others in from the States... But in most cases, if the musician was Asian, they were probably from the Philippines. And if they were white, they were Russian or Ukrainian. Russians had a lock on the nightclub and entertainment business by the mid-1930s. Before we look at the first of these seven singing stars, there's one more person I wanted to quickly mention. She wasn't one of the seven, but she was a very big name and had a strong connection to Li Jinhui. This person was the daughter of Qian Zhuangfei. He was a key figure in the Gu Xunzhang incident. Now, I mentioned this story in that Zhou Enlai Part 2 episode, CHP 162. Qian, he was a communist secret agent planted inside KMT headquarters in Wuhan. When Gu Xunzhang, the head of the CCP secret police, got himself captured in 1931 by the KMT, he knew... As soon as he was strapped down in that chair, he'd sing like a bird. So he defected and told them everything he knew, which was everything the communists were trying to hide. Qian Zhuangfei, I didn't mention his name in that episode, but he was the guy who intercepted the telegram that reported the arrest of Gu Xunzhang. So he was able to sit on that for long enough to get word out to Zhou Enlai's people who were able to tip Zhou Enlai off. So Zhou was able to warn many CCP high-ups to scatter before the KMT secret police rounded them up and did the unthinkable. So Qian's quick thinking saved a few lives from getting snuffed out that day, including Zhou Enlai and Chu Chiu Bai, to name a couple headliners. Qian Zhuangfei, he later died in Guizhou during the Long March. Upon his death, Qian Zhuangfei's daughter, Chen Chen, was entrusted to Li Jinhui, who was this young girl's godfather. And he raised Qian Zhuangfei's daughter as his own. And if you remember from last episode, Li Jinhui's daughter was Li Minghui, China's first pop music star. So this other little girl, daughter of this CCP hero, Qian Zhuangfei, later on became the film and singing legend Li Li Li. She was another alum from the Mingyue Ge Wu Tuan, Li Jinhui's Bright Moon Song and Dance Ensemble, the most reliable springboard for many an aspiring singer and actress. In the early 30s, Li Li Li, the stage name she took using Li Jinhui's surname, began acting in movies. She was one of the biggest movie stars in her day, 1930s and 40s. We should bring up another singer-actor who was also not one of the seven, but would one day affect the entire Shanghai entertainment industry in a big way. Acting alongside Li 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 was a lesser-known actress whose birth name was Li Shu Meng, but had taken the stage name of Lan Ping, Blue Apple. According to fellow entertainers during those years, Lan Ping often lost out to other more elegant, sophisticated actors like Li Li Li. It wasn't that Lan Ping wasn't attractive, it was just that she was considered a bit rustic with a splash of troubled sexual allure that relegated her to specific roles. Though Blue Apple was small potatoes compared to a big star like Li Li Li, she achieved Queen Bee status in the 1960s when Lan Ping was better known as Jiang Qing, a.k.a. Chairman Mao's wife. 
She made sure to let Lee 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 know she wasn't happy to have been outshone by her all those years ago in 1930s Shanghai. Like she did with anyone she had a bone to pick with, Jiang Qing made a couple of calls and Li Li Li, this daughter of a CCP hero, and her husband, Luo Jingyu, got roughed up and had to endure the kind of humiliation and abuse that the Cultural Revolution was famous for. Though her husband didn't survive the persecution, Li 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 lived to 2005 and died in Beijing at the age of 90. Li 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 acted in about 20 movies between 1926 and 1963, most of them during the 1930s. She recorded a few traditional folk songs from the Fengyang County in Anhui Province. One such cut was Xing Fengyang Min Ge, or New Fengyang Folk Song. The song was featured in the 1935 film The Big Road, which in 2004 was listed at number 30 in the best Chinese films. So as I said, Li 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 wasn't one of the seven, but she was a star and was as big a name as all of them. Plus, she came out of the same song and dance ensemble that most of them did. I was wondering how to introduce the seven singing stars of Shanghai. Who should go first? I thought I'd save Zhou Xuan for next episode. She was probably the most famous of them all. I already mentioned Bai Hong's name last episode, that she was married for a time to Li Jinhui's brother and musical collaborator Li Jinguang. She was part of a trio of women called the Three Bais of Beiping, the Beiping San Bai. These three women were Bai Hong, Bai Guang, and another one of the biggest actresses of the 30s and 40s, Bai Yang, the Three Bais. Bai Hong was born Bai Li Zhu in Beijing, or Bei Ping, as it was still called back then, from the start of the Ming Dynasty in 1368 up to 1403. Beijing was called Bei Ping, Northern Peace, instead of Northern Capital. The founding Hongwu Emperor had moved the capital south to Nanjing, then from 1928, during the Republican era, up to liberation in 1949, the city was again renamed officially to Beiping, and the capital of China was moved back to Nanjing. But when I was in Taiwan in 1980, they were still calling it Beiping, and all the maps I used to buy at Caves Books used that name too, and still had Mongolia as part of China. <laughs> Bai Hong was born in 1920 and had been recruited by Li Jianhui at age 11 to join the Mingyue Guotuan, the Bright Moon Song and Dance Troupe. Throughout the 1930s, all the way up to 1950, a year after the communist victory, she recorded music and appeared in movies. Her discography and filmography are both quite extensive. By 1936, Bai Hong was already a megastar in the still relatively brand new industry. Aside from these song and dance troops, there were also these national and regional singing contests that, like today too, I guess, provided a springboard for aspiring young talent like Bai Hong. When she married Li Jinhui's brother, Jin Guang, in 1936, Bai Hong was only 17 years old, and he was 47. Over the course of their 13-year marriage, she had seven children with Li Jinguang. Long this is documented anywhere, but Bai Hong gets credit for being the first performer of this new Mando pop music to give a live concert. This was in 1945 at the end of the war. The venue was the historic Lyceum Theater, still around today at 57 Maoming South Road, the Lanxin Da Xi Yuan. This theater is located right across the street from the Jinjiang Hotel, where I stayed on my first trip to China in August 1980. When the Chinese recording industry first grouped the seven biggest singing stars of the 1940s, Bai Hong, along with Zhou Xuan, were perhaps 
the two biggest names. And just like Li Li Li, Bai Hong's stardom in 1930s Shanghai caught up with her during the Cultural Revolution. She was another victim of Jiang Qing's vendetta with these big stars of 1930s Shanghai. A lot of people bolted from China after 1949, but not everyone did, and they regretted it later. For Bai Hong and all these artists who chose to stay behind, they all had to lay low in the new China of the 1950s and 60s. Their music and film appearances were considered too decadent and unsuitable for the masses, and especially during the Cultural Revolution, their past work became a major liability. Those who had left China for greener pastures elsewhere kept the sound alive and provided the early star power in places like Hong Kong, Malaysia, and Singapore. Bai Hong remained a performer in China, appearing in a number of plays whose content and style passed muster with the authorities. Bai Hong survived the Cultural Revolution and continued her singing career and officially retired in 1979. She died of cancer in 1992 at the age of 73. She died in the same city of her birth, Beijing. <laughs> Another of these three buys was Bai Guang. I first heard Bai Guang on Ian Widgery's 2004 CD, Shanghai Lounge Divas. This was a compilation put out by EMI Hong Kong of all the classic hits from the 1930s with a modern lounge music flavoring added. I still play it after all these years. The original recordings were also included in the two CD set. I'll have a link to it in the Usual episode notes at the teacup.media website. One thing about the Qi Da Ge Xing, each of these seven stars I'm going to introduce was given some kind of nickname by the record company A&R Guys. Bai Guang was known as the queen of the low voice, the Di Yin Ge Ho. She had a voice that sort of broke away from the sound people had grown used to as far as the songs of female singers going back to Mao Mao Yu and the old Chinese folk songs. This was Bai Guang's Te Dian. The thing about her that set her apart, she had that low, sort of husky voice. The Di Yin Ge Ho. Bai Hong, I guess, was the only one who wasn't given a nickname, other than the translation of her stage name, Bai Hong. Bai means white, and Hong means rainbow. So she became simply known as the White Rainbow. Some find this sort of offensive, but Westerners often try to draw parallels between Chinese stars and American singing stars by calling them the so-and-so of China. Bai Hong was China's Mae West, and Bai Guang she was the Marlena Dietrich of the East. Bai Guang was an ethnic Manchurian, also born in Beijing, June 27, 1921. Her birth name was Shi Yang Fen. With Chinese pop music already gaining popularity, she was one of who knows how many thousands who wanted to get into the entertainment business. She studied drama formerly in Beijing and Tokyo. Most of Bai Guang's story takes place in the 1940s and 50s. She got a later start than most. Aside from all the recordings of her songs, Bai Guang is mostly known for her movie career. Between her first film in 1943 till her last in 1958, her IMDb listing shows 13 movies. Another source showed 21 movies in her filmography. One of Bai Guang's notable songs is Xiang Jian Bu Hin Wan, or It's Not Too Late to Meet Each Other. The lyrics echo the theme of the film Xuan Ya Li Ma in that people should think twice before putting off life-altering decisions. Xiang Jian Bu Hin Wan tells the story of two unmarried people who think they have all the time in the world to be together. But fate may have other plans. 
Songs conveying such uncertainty were common in the war-torn 1940s, when the whole country was fighting for its survival, individuals, families, and whole towns existing one day, and then extinguished the next. After World War II, Bai Guang pulled up stakes and moved to Hong Kong and worked with one of the old Chinese studios, Great Wall Pictures. In 1951, Bai Guang married an American GI and moved to Tokyo, where... In 1953, she operated a nightclub in the Ginza area. Now, this marriage didn't last, and she ended up moving back to Hong Kong and picked up where she left off in her movie and singing career. By then, she was a household name in that part of the world. In 1959, in her late 30s, she retired from the entertainment biz and married a gentleman, 20 years her junior, she moved her residence to Kuala Lumpur in 1969 and lived a relatively reclusive life. And ten years later, in 1979, she had a big comeback concert in Taiwan. You know, it was always a big deal when one of the Chi Da Xing made an appearance on TV or in concert, you know, being so inexorably linked to that fabled era in Shanghai. But for the most part, Bai Guang spent her last decades mostly living away from the limelight. In 1995, she made an appearance at a TVB awards show and passed away four years later of colon cancer. Other than those two appearances in 1979 and 1995, Bai Guang laid low, enjoyed life, and no doubt reflected from time to time what the entertainment business was like when she got into it in the 1940s as one of Chinese cinema's early sex symbols and what it had become a half century later. Deng Zhe Ni Hui Lai was her biggest hit and probably one of the most enduring songs to come out of that whole Shi Dai Chu musical era. <laughs> The oldest of the seven singing stars was Gong Chiu Xia, because she was the eldest. She was referred to as Da Jie, or Big Sister, a name she picked up after appearing in an early role in a 1937 movie called Four Sisters. You can guess which one she was. Her original name was Gong Xia Xia. She was born in Shanghai in 1916. One source said Jiangsu, which is close enough for me. I hate to say this, but... In order to package her up just right so the average Western foreign film aficionado might relate to her, Gong Cho Sha was called the older Shirley Temple, who was born a dozen years later in 1928. She got this moniker because thanks to her time spent in one of the other song and dance troupes where she performed for five years. She got her start at 12 years of age and became a heck of a tap dancer, something that came in handy for movies that required such a skill set. Her IMDb listing credits her with 52 films, but she appeared in more than those. She shot 60 films alone in the Hong Kong-based Greater China Film Company. She sort of got typecast after a while whenever a role required a sincere older woman with caring matronly qualities, something she grew tired of after a while. <laughs> One notable number that Gong Cho Sha recorded was called The Rose Always Opens. I'll always be partial to this one because I remember it being the first old Shanghai track that caught my ear and I couldn't wait to play it on my old-timey music radio show on Nashville, Tennessee's 91.1 WRVU. I thought it fit nicely between Fat Swaller and Jelly Roll Morton anyway. Here's some of the lyrics. Roses bloom everywhere. Youth is everywhere. God wants roses everywhere. He also calls us to love as much as possible. Spring is a beautiful bride. Roses on the ground are her dowry. They who retains the heart of a teenager deserves to be her lover. Gong Cho Sha was one of those in the entertainment business who early on correctly predicted hard times ahead for the new China after 1949. So she joined the crowds who quit the newly minted PRC in 1949 for greener pastures in Hong Kong and then later in 1967 in Taiwan. 
She later died in Hong Kong in September 2004, aged 88. Let me introduce Wu Yingying, the Bi Yin Ge Ho, the Queen of the Nasal Voice. <laughs> She was born in June 1922 as Wu Jianqiu in Ningbo, but grew up next door in Shanghai. She had a somewhat different kind of a story. Wu Yingying, she came from an educated family. Both parents were professionals. Her father was a chemical engineer, and her mother was an OB gyno physician. They had big career plans for their daughter, and well, becoming a performer in the budding Shanghai entertainment business was not among them. But like many a star-struck youth in the 1930s, she got bitten by the bug early, and all she dreamed of becoming was a singer and performer. So as a youth, she had to play this cat and mouse game with her parents to indulge in her dreams. Yet at the same time, you know, appear to toe the Confucian line with her parents. She was able to get on the radio using a fake name, and you know, someone was listening on the other end and noticed her. So early on, she. Showed great potential. In 1946, after the war, when Wu Yingying was 24, she got her big break in a singing contest. And after she won, all the clubs and ballrooms started chasing her. Pathé and other record companies all tried to sign her. Here is where she took on the stage name of Wu Yingying, Yingying, the Sound of the Oriole. And pretty much beginning in 1948, she was one of the top singers in Shanghai. And whoever the stars were in Shanghai, they were the biggest names in all the overseas Chinese communities across Southeast Asia and beyond. Wu Yingyin stayed in China after 1949, but exited the turnstiles in 1957, and set up her new residence in Hong Kong, where she continued her career. Unlike the other singing stars, she opted not to parlay her singing success into a movie career. By the 1980s, she started to slow down and ended up moving to L.A., settling down in Pasadena. After four decades at the highest rungs of the Chinese pop music biz, she was very well known. And even into her 70s and 80s, she still got out there occasionally and sang all her greatest hits. <laughs> She remained very active into the 1990s, doing the circuit not just in L.A. but overseas as well. She still drew standing room only crowds with the overseas Chinese throughout Southeast Asia and charitable causes too. Wu Yingying used her star power to raise plenty of money, and all those people nostalgic for that bygone era could relive those memories, listening to one of the originals sing those familiar numbers. She passed away at the ripe old age of 87 in Los Angeles on December 17, 2009. She was still making stage appearances all the way up to the end, almost. Long road. Well, thought I might be able to squeeze one more in, but I'm gonna just make an executive decision to hold on to Li Xianglan until next episode. So let's call it a day and save the silvery voice of Yao Li and the golden voice of Zhou Xuan for next time. Let me say again: once people like Li Jinhui, the Shaw brothers, and many other pioneers and corporations got this music and movie business up and running in China. It opened the floodgates to an array of talent, the likes of which had never been seen before, and a platform was created where a whole slew of singing and film stars shined and became sensations all over Greater China and elsewhere. We're only looking at the most famous names in this series. Okay, that's it for now. As usual, this is your host, creator, producer, and presenter, Laszlo Montgomery. Signing off from that fantastic city in the smog, Los Angeles, California. Don't you wish that you can be here too? And I'm Spun Counter Guy from the In the Corner Back by the Woodpile podcast, signing off from the Great Bluegrass Commonwealth of Kentucky, USA. Oh yeah, and by the way, since the commencement of the Year of the Pig, 
I have received a grand total of 48 five-star ratings in Apple Podcasts. 48. Now, considering the millions of you out there who listen to the CHP and that half of all podcast listeners use iOS devices, I read that somewhere, I'm asking for the third time in nine years. How about showing me just a little bit of love? I'm not asking for a review. Just hit the five-star rating and join more than half a thousand people of wealth and taste who have already done that good and worthy deed for me, your humble narrator. And Matt Sheehan's new book is soon out, The Trans-Pacific Experiment, How China and California Collaborate and Compete for Our Future. Want to get more informed about the relationship between Silicon Valley, the Golden State, and the PRC? Yeah, Matt's one of the most informed voices speaking about that subject. Out now on Counterpoint Press. An Amazon link is in the episode notes. Matt Sheehan, The Trans-Pacific Experiment. How China and California Collaborate and Compete for Our Future. Okay, take care everyone. See you next time for the conclusion of this series. Not to mention another exciting episode of the China History Podcast. Mm -hmm.